welcome to the stars in the making with the mission to inspire and frame the future. On this episode, the star is Alex Tepkov from Russia moved to US with his parents as a teen. In spite of the family struggle, he managed to finish high school and college with masters in system engineering. Today, Alex is a software engineer, real estate investor, and the creator of the app Investomation that will tell you in real time which area worth investing in the United States. On this particular episode, you will learn how to deal with uncertain times, what it means class A, B, C in real estate. He's a big believer that if you want to get on top of your game, you have to read books to find answers. Himself, he got to the point of reading 60 books a year, of course, the combination of both physical and audio book. Please, let's welcome the star, Alex. Alex. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, so I read your story. You have an amazing story. You work your way up from zero pretty much to up there. I'm really interested to know your story and also whoever is watching uh, can take something very productive and maybe something that they can, you know, put in their story, motivate them to really, um, you know, work their way up to the top as well. So please introduce yourself. Uh, so my name is Alex. Uh, we came here, Alex Sapkov. We came here with my family when I was a teenager. Parents got divorced shortly after. Uh, basically my mom raised myself and my sister and went to college for um, computer engineering. And it wasn't one of those where I had like a scholarship lined up. I didn't have, uh, didn't have the money for it either. And initially we were denied loans too because we were in this position where we're like above where the, you get the federal grants, but below the level where um, you actually can sustain yourself and where uh, the private loans, um, where you actually get money for the private loans. Wow. So what I ended up doing just to go to college is we ended up applying on my uh, form saying that I get child support from my father, which we didn't. So that yeah. was the, that just bumped the amount high enough right, right. where we were eligible for uh, a private loan. Got that, so made my way to school, graduated in three years, uh, started working. In so you had you had issues in high school. That's what because of like your parents, like so your mom, she was struggling along the way. Is so, that correct? Yeah. So the issues weren't really like. Uh, so we went to school in Newton, which is like a really nice area. Yeah, and uh, the reason for this is because like Russian parents are kind of like Asian parents. They put, uh, they invest everything into their children. That's even, correct. Very even true. Even if they like take away a piece of themselves, mm. uh, away from themselves, just to make sure that the children have a, the best future possible. But I always felt like in Newton, like. I felt like one of the poorest kids and I also felt like an outsider because I didn't speak the language fluently, I didn't get a lot of the jokes. Right. Even earlier today we ah, spoke about ah, the whole <laughs> Rocky thing. So. Yeah, that's right. So uh, uh, there is something very interesting. How old were you when you got here? Uh, I was 12 years old. When 12 I, years old. Yeah. Oh, wow. That's a really long time. Yeah, yeah go ahead, please. I don't want to cut you yeah, off. Um, yeah. Uh, so came here. Parents got divorced when I was 14 yeah. and really like I felt like it was... Uh, there was a little bit of that, uh, not a little bit, but there was definitely some teenage trauma there uh, right. as a result of the experience. Yeah. And I feel like that was the first part that got me um, trying to challenge my thinking patterns at the time because yeah. I realized that if I keep approaching life, yeah. like, I was a super lazy kid. Um, there were lower classes like math and physics I could just like skate by like without really doing much but i yeah. wasn't really, like i wasn't an a student um and it wasn't until like i almost didn't get into college that i realized that look i should really start working on myself i should at least um like and even then it wasn't like it wasn't the same kind of working on myself i do now but yeah, i at yeah. least became um more motivated, my grades changed. I actually started applying myself more in college. Yeah, this, and part yeah. of it was also like when you do, when you work on a major that you've picked, 
as opposed to being forced to learn those classes that are forced on you, like history, English, which I didn't really enjoy. That helped a lot as well. Oh, nice. Yeah, so I was really thinking when I read that, like things that they were forced to you, because those are the cl classes that are required in school. Mm -hmm. Like you have to take them in order to graduate. If you don't take them, you don't graduate. Is that yep. correct? Yeah. Mm, I see. So you were good in math and which classes? Uh, math, physics. So like I, math is one of those things I see as necessary evil. Like I don't enjoy math, but I get it. And yeah. um, if I see a purpose, all of a sudden I get better, if that makes sense. Like, for, yeah. so for example, uh, if you ask me like, okay, what, what's the derivative of this uh, in, in math? And it's like, it's very theoretical. So like, I don't enjoy that. Like in that, I'm not even gonna study. Mm. Well, I will study if I need to pass the exam, but um, on f for physics, I really enjoyed physics because all of a sudden, like for kinematics, for example, if you can predict if something's falling exactly where it's gonna land, yeah that's a lot more useful. That's actually like, I see purpose there. So all of a sudden, all of that uh, calculus that I, I was taking classes that I didn't enjoy, I did enjoy. And all of a sudden, like I got a name physics because I like wow. it more. And once you got to, co once you got to college, mm -hmm. that's when everything started taking off. Uh, it, I, it, you did you did the college degree of four years in three years. Is yes, that correct? That is correct, yeah. Mm. And I did it because I wanted to save uh, on the tuition. That, that was the only reason. Again, this is like sort of like what we spoke about earlier. Uh -huh. um, you don't, until you put yourself in a situation where you have to try, a lot of us don't try, myself included. Right. Um, and I was a lazy kid. So like if I, if money wasn't an issue, I probably would have done a regular four year degree. I maybe would have done it like a Van Wilder, like in yeah. six years, I don't mm -hmm. know. Um, but it, the fact that I needed to save money and start earning money as soon as possible right. is what pushed me to finish my degree in three mm. years. It's like your, uh, your parents, uh, you wanted to earn, earn money like as fast as possible in order for you to help your, your mom or there is something in particular that you were looking for? I, so it wasn't even so much like, I, obviously like I, I do yeah. want to help my mom as well, yeah, but yeah. like obviously uh, like it wasn't even so much that it was, I had goals, I had dreams. Right, right, right. And if I was to achieve them, I had to go faster because I started, if you, if you think about life as a race, it's yes. a marathon. Mm -hmm. Um, just the fact that I came from a different country, came from nothing, like I started farther back. So I needed to catch up to the other guys first That's right. before I could be where they are. Wow. That's amazing. And there is something that you spoke that really, uh, I think that it's very important for anybody out there to understand because there is uh, as youth, young people, you know, you think that you are 20 today or you are 19, so you have so much time. Yeah. But actually, you were talking to me about the emergency in life. Yeah. How you can approach life in order for you to accomplish anything. So it doesn't matter what age are you, you have to focus and remember where you want to get in life. Exactly. As young as you are, the better. So please explain a little bit about, um, about you. How do you start this? Sure. So in general, yeah. like I see my life as like a series of these like minor emergencies that kind of yeah. like build upon themselves. Uh -huh. It's kind of like these, like you have, we all have peaks and valleys in life. And what I noticed is that when things are going well, uh, I tend to get complacent. We, I feel like that's the case for a lot of us. We all tend to get complacent. And if there is one thing in one of the books, I don't remember which one, um, the author said like, what prevents having a great life? Yeah. And it's having a good life. So when things are going well, there's little motivation to, um, to basically to accelerate, to yeah. do more. But it's usually when, um, I don't know if I'm, al am I allowed to, s to swear on this podcast? No, go ahead, go ahead. It's usually when shit hits the fan that yeah. you realize, okay, <laughs> I like what, what I've been doing up until this point isn't working. I need to change. I need to do something different. Right. So my life in general has been a series of these kind of like pressure points and plateaus when I saw it and things get better. Um, so I'm not like, there are a lot of guys like even Grant Cardone you mentioned or like yeah. Alex Hermosi exactly. earlier today that are just like, they just plow through life and they just keep accelerating. So like, unfortunately I, I can't do that. Like I, I'm not like those people I can't, like I, 
I still have my plateaus. And like, yes, when exactly. things go well, I'm kind of like, okay, well, like t- time to like cruise for a while. I'll... And usually what happens is like every time I've gone through a point that like cruise by, it lasts for like maybe a year, maybe a two, to where I get to another point in life where a new pressure builds up where I realize, okay, I can't stay at this plateau anymore. I need to keep advancing. Um, one of them, the first um, pressure point was college. Yeah. Uh, the second pressure point, I would say, was after my, uh, after my first job, I tried to build a startup with a friend. Yeah. Uh, that didn't really work out. As a software As a, Yeah, it was a software startup. Yeah, it yeah, was, yeah. Uh, this was before, this was when iPads were just becoming a thing. Yeah. And we were going to create this app that's sort of like um, an iPad version of a PowerPoint where you draw you, sketches and it, they basically come to life. Yeah. Um, that didn't really work out. There was a lot of what I didn't know about running a business that I've later discovered. The, the gaps were a lot higher than I thought, and I thought I was gonna figure it out myself. Um, and as I told you later, I've realized that it's oftentimes smarter to either pay someone else, either as a mentor, or um, just buy a course yeah. um, to get you through um, that point faster. Interesting. Uh, there is. I'm going to really. St- uh, I'm gonna get off the so as a software engineer. You are a real estate investor mm-hmm. as well. So I wanted to talk about that. There is something in your in your story that really caught my attention. When you talk about what something that you really had to face, something hard in into like the issue. You saw it as an issue, and then you had to solve. You say that you got. You got depressed over that. Mm-hmm. Is a lawsuit. Yep. Yeah. Talk to me about the lawsuit and how you overcame that. Okay. Yeah. So back in 2013, I was buying my first mm-hmm. uh, home. It was going to be a like, I thought at that time it was going to be my forever home. The way I move in, I li- it, it, like right around here in Waltham actually. Right. Uh, and the house got rezoned into a flood zone as I was buying it. Uh, and if you know anything about 2013, that was after Hurricane Katrina, which basically depleted uh, the entire federal f- uh, f- flood um, insurance budget. Yeah. Uh, and they realized they're going to increase um, the premiums. At the same time, they redrew the flood maps. So like, basically, two agencies uh, decided to address the issue at the same time and I got screwed in the process where the house went from not needing flood insurance to requiring about $500 of flood insurance to requiring over $7,000 of flood insurance per year. Wow. And I decided I wasn't going to go through with the purchase, yep. but the seller um, insisted that I still owe her the earnest money deposit. So we were making an argument that was material change. Yeah. The house changed, she wasn't buying it. So for two years, uh, we spent two years in the lawsuit back and forth. Um, and yeah, I got depressed as a result because this lawsuit basically represented, um, like I, I lost a third of my savings at the time. Wow. You lost your savings? A third of it. A third wow, of it. Wow, yeah. So ba- the honest money. Well, so it was, so we ended up settling yeah. uh, out of court. Um, and I got, we basically split the earnest deposit in half. I got half, she got to keep half. But also, um, we both paid attorney fees, which was higher than that anyway. So it was, had I known that, I probably would have just said, okay, um, forget the earnest money deposit. Like yeah. if I had the mindset I have now, I would have realized that in the time and stress and the energy I spent fighting that lawsuit, I could have made that money back faster right. through different means. And there is one thing that you, you said, and you invest in all over the United States. What is the difference in investing in just one state to, you know, investing all over the United States? You invest all over the United States. What is the, the, the like the pros and cons? Mm-hmm. Like if you can sum it up, what is the pros and cons to, for that? Sure. So most people, most real estate investors invest in their own backyard just because it's more convenient right. or it seems to be more convenient on paper. Uh, and up and a lot, real estate is ancient basically. We've been doing, like people have been buying real estate since before this country existed. And the thing about real estate is that it's really low tech and the margins are pretty big. So like why does 
Like if you can afford to pay 5% closing fees to your agent, which represents like between 20 to $60,000, depending on where you buy the house, um, there's enough meat in the bone to pay that commission to someone else. So because of that, it tends to be um, very low tech. High tech usually comes in when the margins get squeezed and the real estate didn't get to there yet. Uh, it's getting to, eventually it will get there. But uh, basically, um, if you don't apply, uh, if, if you don't use technology in real estate, you're basically limited to investing in your backyard. Because a lot of people want to be able to visit the property, inspect it themselves. Uh, if they need to do work on the property or meet with a contractor, they need to be there physically. And that's the lens how, through which a lot of people see real estate oh, investing. Um, it turns out that in the last decade, uh, a lot has changed. New technologies got added, new web apps, new like, like Redfin didn't even exist until I think 2010 or so. Okay. So like a lot, there's been a huge technological revolution in real estate as well that allows you to do a lot more remote. Like even the county directives are all online now. Uh, you don't need to physically uh, stop by, um, by city hall to get any of the, this information anymore. Mm -hmm which opens up a lot of doors. And me being a software developer, I try to do as much stuff uh, on my computer as I can and as little as I can, uh, like as I have to physically. So that initially was a drawback because like I couldn't do like driving for dollars. I couldn't, um, I couldn't do the same things that real estate investors who were local, who were doing it full-time were doing. And I couldn't do it full-time either because like I told you, like, yeah. I still have a, my So job. is that, is that, all this has to do with the laws, like that can benefit you. It's it's not the laws. Well, well, so let me get to the laws. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Every state, every city has their own laws, yeah. and some laws. Like Boston is very tenant friendly. Yeah. Whereas something like Florida or Texas is very landlord friendly, and usually that doesn't uh, come up until tenant and landlord have a confrontation. Uh, with your typical tenant and your typical land, the confrontation doesn't arise. Where it arises when, when you're investing in up and coming areas, you have a lot of tenants who um, don't grow with the area. Right. Um, tenants who see rules and regulations as optional, they don't see them as requirements. They see rent as optional mm -hmm. because that's what they were used to. And those are the kind of tenants who typically you would need to take to court to evict them. Um, and they're more common in these up and coming areas, mm -hmm. um, C-class neighborhoods. And I don't know if you want to meet. Yeah, to touch exactly. So, so there is this C-class. When you're talking about yeah. the C-class in your story, you also mentioned about uh, you don't want to invest in C-class. Is that actually correct? that's where like in Boston, my yeah. initial investments were in C-class. Oh, yes. so what is the difference? Cause there's, people out there that they don't understand what is the A class, B class, C class. What is that? Can you break it that sure. down? What is that? So there's a couple dimensions to think about in, in real estate. One is each city has its own thing going. Real estate is very local. That's why there's the saying location, location, location. Mm -hmm. um, so for example, Boston is growing, it's growing population, it's growing in jobs, whereas mm -hmm. something like Detroit is shrinking both in population and jobs. Um, and within the city, there's also the concept of neighborhoods. Yeah. There's a concept of A-class neighborhood where you have people who can afford to buy a house, but they may still choose to rent. Um, this is places like Newton, for example. Yeah. Then you have your B-class neighborhood. The B-class neighborhood is somewhere where you have maybe blue collar people, maybe still like not blue collar, maybe like white collar still people, but mm -hmm. uh, they tend to be a cheaper neighborhood. For example, Waltham would be such a neighborhood. Yeah. And then you have a C-class neighborhood. A C-class neighborhood um, is a neighborhood where um, you may have a lot more subsidized tenants, you may have more um, problematic tenants, you may have more crime. Uh, these neighborhoods, they tend to cash flow well, better because yeah. the rent compared to mortgage tends to be higher. Oh. But uh, also you're less likely to collect that rent because there's other issues. Uh, to deal with tenants. So they tend to be more maintenance heavy, these areas. Oh, okay. And then there's also D-class neighborhoods, which uh, like I would call, I'm not sure if you could call Brockton a D-class neighborhood. Like okay. in Chicago, there's a lot of D-class neighborhoods. Right. 
In Detroit, there's a lot of D-class neighborhoods. I wouldn't really say Boston has a lot of D-class neighborhoods, but like may maybe you could call Brockton that. And that's basically uh, a war zone. Wow. That, that's what the D-class neighborhood is. I interesting. Well, uh, uh, so how do you cope? I see that in general, right? There is a lot of conflicts between having your job, which is, I'll say, quote unquote, the nine to five, mm -hmm. plus something that you're also working on, you know, on yourself. Like that's your own thing. What are you trying to invest and in to come up to eventually maybe drop your nine to five job? Mm -hmm. So for you as a software engineer and plus, uh, you know, an investor, a real estate investor, how do you cope with these two things? Mm -hmm. Is that bring you conflict or? I mean, so being a software developer, my job schedule is um, like, it's not flexible, but like if yeah. I need to um, go to my property or something for an hour, like half an hour, like I can tell my manager that it's, it's not going to be the end of the world. With that right. said, uh, for the most part, this is why I do buy and hold and not flips, mm. because flips are actually more time consuming when you're building them. You have to meet with your contractors. Well, you have to be there. Buy the and day. hold. Uh, we have to understand that. So what is the difference of both? Buy and hold is your typical rental. So yeah. you say you buy a three family mm -hmm. uh, and you rent each of the units. You may still rehab the units beforehand, but uh, so yeah. that, that, that's buy and hold. Uh, and then flipping is basically you buy a house that's in bad shape. Uh, you rehab it, you make it look like new again, mm -hmm. and then you resell it for profit. Wow. It's amazing. Way before we even uh, go, thank you so much for that because we don't have so much time. I wanted to run into the something very interesting. What was the time that you had to read 60 book mm -hmm. a year? Sure. Talk to us about that. That's very interesting. Sure. So right as I was going through that lawsuit that like dragged on for two years, I got really depressed. Yeah. Um, and I needed a way to cope with that depression. And usually uh, what works best if you're depressed is to find a distraction, but it has to be a good distraction, like just uh, binging on a destructive habit. That's not a good distraction. Yeah. It gets even more depressed. But um, it's a good time to build a new habit when you, when you are depressed. You find something, either a hobby or you find like either something you want to do, maybe a new job, maybe a new business, and you build that. So for me, what that was, um, so for a while, I wanted to read more books. And like, I just wasn't getting there, like five years after college, I still was maybe getting for like one or two books per year. And that's nothing really to write home about. Right, right. And it was a combination of a book I've read at the time, 10X by Grant Cardone, and also trying to find something new to redefine myself as because I knew that um, I just lost a third of my savings. So like That's right. losing a third of my savings was very depressing and kind of I knew that like no matter what, even if I get it back at the end of the two year period, I'm not going to get all of it back. I knew that. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to figure out like, what is it? What can I do? What can I get that like can never be taken away from me? And like yeah. that's knowledge. Knowledge. True. And I needed to, in order to catch up, again, I was in this situation where I realized I was falling behind and I needed to catch up. Um, I needed to figure out wh what's the best way of doing it. And I realized like after reading that 10X book that like, look, if I'm not getting through like even like, let's say 60 books per year, let me multiply that by 10. Um, and then immediately that changed something in my head because mm. When you s set yourself a problem like that, you know, like if you're not reading six books per year, there is no way you're gonna read 60 books approaching that problem at the same, like the same way that you've been approaching it right now. So what that does is it forces your mind to get creative. Right. So once your mind gets creative, you try to figure out what can I do to meet that goal? How can I make it happen? So that's when I started, um, uh, when, when I say read, I didn't read physically read all of them. There's some, a combination of audio books. There's audio a combination books of like I've set up some speed reading tools. So yes, Reedy is one of them. That's uh, uh, good. It uses like this. well, at the end of the yeah. day, you retain the knowledge. Exactly, yeah. and that's so and that's what that's, matters. It's that's, not a, that's makes sense. Yeah, yeah. I'm I'm not doing it for the process of reading books. Yeah. I'm doing it to retain the knowledge. And that's for that true. reason, mm -hmm. um, 
like I started looking at like what are all the free chunks so like not even free but like what is the time I'm wasting during the day maybe when I'm driving maybe when I'm on the bus somewhere or on a subway um, and I real and I decided I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this my core I'm gonna like if there's if there's one thing they can never take away from me it's my knowledge so I'm gonna build up my knowledge and I'm gonna build it by reading 60 books per year and if nothing else comes out of it if I don't learn anything new at least I can brag about that because even the fact that you get through 60 books per year that alone is impressive wow that's really impressive and one thing is very important that we maybe many don't understand out there uh, you can see that some people before after they finish college they literally you know they don't care about books anymore they don't find like new knowledge new niche or whatever like okay just because they finished college they think that they know it all they don't they don't read what is one thing you want to tell people um, out there like regardless of all the certificates you have from school because at the end of the day that's just the paper right. like after college you have that's the, the point like really that's like the point where you have to start studying we go like in jobs or things like that so what is the one thing that you would tell anyone out there um, in these regards? Uh, so educate yourself as much as you can. Like, don't just, I guess like find something you enjoy and learn it. Like I have, uh, like my thing is like, I get bored of doing one thing. So yeah. in that sense, that actually helps me here because I tend to build new hobbies. Like my hobbies today are different than my hobbies were two years ago. My hobbies two years ago were different than my hobbies four years ago. I always keep, like I actually enjoy picking up new hobbies or new skills. Mm. Uh, like even we spoke earlier today, I started video editing. Like I'm not good at it, but I started doing it just to see, hey, oh, how does it go. work? Like, yeah. and I'm slowly getting better at it as well. So. Keep learning your whole life. And a lot of people think like, oh, maybe because I'm 40 or 50, like I'm too old to start learning. That's Colonel right. Sanders started KFC when he was 79. Talk to me about it. I just read this guy. It's, a, it's an amazing story. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So like you're never too old. Um, the other thing is um, the more you learn the, your whole life, yeah. the slower your brain ages. And that, that's a fact that's been proven. Um, Rockefeller. Repeat that again. The more, the more you keep learning, yeah. the slower your brain ages. Mm. And Rockefeller, at 95 years old, right. he was still running his company, and he even um, was attending lawsuits when they were trying to uh, destroy his company for monopoly. They were just trying to break it apart, and he was like, at 95 years old, he was thinking and feeling better than a typical person in their 40s. Wow, that's amazing. And what is the one thing that you think, as young people out there, do you think that they are 19? I think I repeat, I'm repeating this question again because this is really, I think it's very important for us to emphasize that, that part. Think that you are too young, and you don't want to read, oh, I have time. You know, mm -hmm. you talk about the time, yeah. the time frame. What is the important thing, the pressure? Because sometimes right. you need pressure to put on yourself. Right. So if you think you're too young, you're never going to get there. Yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. So like, as I mentioned earlier, my life was like, I see it as a series of small pressures and each time I get smarter and better. Um, one of the things I wish I picked up early on um, that I am definitely going to teach my kid much earlier than um, I've learned is understanding finances, understanding economics, how um, how economics works for a country and, and at a global level as well. And after I got into real estate, I started understanding inflation. And inflation, once you understand inflation, you start um, becoming more motivated in life because inflation is effectively a tax on money on wealth that doesn't rotate in the system. But your knowledge, everything else works the same way. Basically, if you think about it, like let me give you an analogy. If you think about your life as sort of like getting a bucket of water out of the well, uh, you have to continuously keep pulling. If you let go, the bucket doesn't just get stuck in midair, it falls back to the bottom and you have to start all over again. That's true. So that's how you should see your skills, that's how you should see your resources as well. Because inflation is basically a tax on wealth that doesn't rotate. 
Yeah. Um, and what made me realize is like, like I'm talking not in terms of knowledge, I'm talking in terms of like, like making use of my money and why I started investing in real estate as opposed to just keeping my money in a bank account. Because yeah. I realized that it was effectively getting eroded in a bank account. And the more time I spent not taking action, yeah. not investing in real estate, <laughs> um, the more that bucket of money that I already pulled out of the well was dropping back was, to the bottom. Was going down, which yeah. is you're going to have to restart all over again. Exactly. So mm -hmm. I've realized that... Uh, time is precious. Time is precious. Um, and basically, when you're standing still in life, you're not just standing still, you're standing in quicksand. True. So if you see life that way, you'll, you'll never slow down because there's like, you almost get depressed if you stop doing anything. That's true. In life. And if you listen or, or like even read the books of like by Bill, I read a lot of biographies as well. Like I really enjoy those books. Yeah. I don't read fiction, but I do read biographies. Yeah. And if you read those, you'll see um, a trend that a lot of people basically who made something of themselves in life, um, they get depressed if they don't do anything. Even when like, let's say, um, What's a good example? I, I can't think of the top of my head right now, but typically, okay, so the CEO of Zappos. Yeah. When Amazon bought his company, and I don't remember the guy's name anymore, apologies, but when, when Amazon bought his company, uh, they you basically would- Jeff, Jeff Bezos, you mean? Uh, no, no, Jeff Bezos is for Amazon. Yeah, Zappos yeah. is a different um, oh, okay. person who, like Jeff Bezos bought their company. Yeah. Uh, so what happened is they typically when they buy you out they give you this uh vesting schedule so you have to stay with them for like four years and on paper it seems okay like you stay for four years and they give you like you become a billionaire afterwards like who would be stupid enough to leave before but turns out, like a lot of people actually leave way earlier before their vesting expires because they feel depressed they feel like they're not doing anything uh they're wasting their time there basically and that's the difference between like a wealthy mindset and a broke mindset is that people who are wealthy they value their time more than they value the money because they realize money they can always get back <laughs> that's that that's so true it there is one thing that you think it's very useful uh, there is anything like on real estate or software engineer whatever what do you think that um, a youth um, should do like mm -hmm. out there it's like what is the let me rephrase the question in the real estate what is one thing that you would tell someone to start start it off with so not just in if real you want to invest yeah not mm -hmm. just in real estate anywhere uh mentors mm -hmm. so uh i spend the bulk of my 20s um trying to learn everything myself and I realized in hindsight, I've spent a lot more time learning it than I could have if I just um, uh, found a mentor yeah. who already was doing this. So a mentor can take shape in multiple forms. Most people already use subconscious their parents as mentors. Yeah. What many people don't realize is that our, our parents are suboptimal mentors. If you, unless your parent is a millionaire, don't take financial advice from them. Yeah. Uh, Unless your parents, yeah, unless your parents are millionaires, don't take financial advice from them. That's right. Uh, we're, but a That's lot of people do. A lot of people do. It's counterintuitive, but a lot of people like they assume that they can take all sorts of advice from their parents. And if you look at poor communities, oftentimes, more often than not, it's not even their skin color or other things that hold them back. More often than not, it's their family because they're taking advice from the wrong people. Um. But yeah, I would definitely recommend, like, even if, like, and, and again, going back to the mentors, it can take form in many shapes. Yeah. It could be, right now, a lot of information you can find for free on YouTube. So if you're broke, if you have no money, yeah. uh, find uh, people like Alex Hermosi and you. Find people like Grant Cardone, learn from them. And I told you earlier, like, I'm not a yeah. big fan of Grant Cardone's personality, yeah. but I have tremendous respect for him. He knows how to make money. So, like, I'll that. still listen to his to, podcast. Yeah. Um, and there is one thing that I don't want to forget. How do you learn? Uh, because there is, I think people that 
scared with mistake by making mistakes mm -hmm. as we were talking earlier mm -hmm. um, everything that you you started many you did many things and one thing you told me that really got my attention is trying things and not being afraid of mistakes yeah so this goes back to the quicksand yeah um, um, what is it called the um, framework right? right so if you imagine yourself standing in quicksand you realize that not taking action is actually more expensive than making a mistake. So the best thing you can do is do the thing correctly. The second best thing you can do is not not to do anything, but to do it wrong. Wow. And not doing anything is at the very bottom in terms of the utility it will give you for life. Because if you make a mistake, even if you screw up, even if you lose, um, first of all, if you're in your 20s, even if you lose everything, you still get plenty of time to make it back. Wow. Uh, but you also have experience and now that means emergency we have for emergency yeah. we have got to have emergency in exactly life. exactly right. yeah um and at the end of the day um the other thing i also realized like don't uh this was at my first job and this is like an anecdote i'm gonna share yeah uh right before i quit my first job to try to do my startup um what reinforced my thinking that i'm doing the right thing yeah. was a guy who was sitting in cubicle not far from me. The guy was in his 60s. Yeah. He felt depressed. He felt, and this was like 2008, right? When there was like a round of layoffs and he was afraid to lose his job. And I kind of started realizing, it's like, I don't want that to be me when I'm 60. And the reason he's in that boat is because he never took risks. It's because he thought the safest thing was to keep the same job for like 40 plus years that seemed safest to him but in reality that's what put him where he was where he was in his 60s and he was afraid that's for his well-being that's so true to the core i can't agree more with that you just nailed it uh, this is so 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 true i think people have uh, just like the story says people are scared to take risks they get comfortable there is something that you also said on i see your story saying mm -hmm. that you were comfortable at some point mm -hmm. at your job, which is the quote-unquote the nine-to-five job, mm -hmm. but you always wanted to build something, mm -hmm. to be a boss of your own things. Mm -hmm. And there is something that, what is that done on you like to start? It's like books that you read, stories, or someone push you like, hey, you have to start your own thing. Is that it? But for all your startups. Um, so I relatively young, even back in Russia, like yeah. I, like I always had this, like this entrepreneurial drive, they call it, or like desire to start something of my yeah. own. Uh, and like at different points in life, I had different role models. Like in Russia, like I didn't have access to the internet. I didn't have access. I, like it was very limited portions of US culture even had access to. Yeah. So I wanted to be like Walt Disney. I wanted to build my own Disneyland. I, I wanted to, yeah. Mm -hmm. All those I, dreams. Yeah, that was the only entrepreneur uh, like I had intimate in, experience in, with back in Russia. So that was your dream from like the very beginning, the very start. Yeah, I, yeah, I always wanted to do something but you didn't uh, know specific. But I didn't know what, and uh, being like the software was my, my first area of expertise, I decided yeah. I'm gonna start building in software. And then in software, I also realized, um, one of the things in software is like, the market's very competitive because there's a bunch of guys just like me who have the same strengths, same weaknesses mm. as me, uh, competing with me. That's right. And then in real estate, I realized something completely opposite. There's a bunch of guys who have completely opposite strengths and weaknesses for me. So what I can do is understand their strengths and learn how to mimic them, but then bring my own strengths that they don't have. And that's how I get competitive advantage. I love and that. as I told you earlier, I love that, that the, the willingness to invest remotely, uh, and unwillingness to invest locally initially started as my weakness that I've then turned into my strength. Wow. And one thing very unique about you and about your story, when you tell about your story, you go so much on your uniqueness. I think uh, myself as well, I love to see my, you know, the big guys that are doing things, whatever out there, but I love the uniqueness. And how can you 
make yourself unique like especially i'm going specifically in real estate you okay. i think you already told about it how can you make yourself unique in everything that you do is by learning the strength as you said yeah. strength and weaknesses is that right All right so yeah exactly so you have to understand your own strengths your own weaknesses i'm not that organized uh which is why i use uh cms now so it's a content management system basically like they do their handle the organization for you it's basically like this portal i would say for your deal flow um and then i'm creative so like i try to use creativity when i can yeah um in, in real estate so it's like it really depends on like what your unique strengths and weaknesses are and you can apply them in any field not only you're going to enjoy it more because it's kind of like remixing it it's making yeah. it unique to you but you also you don't feel like you're doing the same thing a thousand other people are doing and um like maybe wondering why it's not working with that said if you are going to a new field don't immediately try to be unique there try to do what's working first try to learn from the pros first and then once you get the core concepts down like buy your first house first start renting it out and then after that you can figure out okay how do i want to scale this thing like what do like how can i apply my strengths to make this business more Work. unique to unique. me yeah. awesome oh man i love your story it's such an amazing to share your experience with us with the stars in the making it's really beautiful i hope you guys out there uh really take some knowledge from this very rich story and keep fighting for your dreams so there is anything like any piece of word that you of encouragement you're gonna send out there uh to close uh yeah so today with access to internet um so there's no excuse not to succeed even if it doesn't happen immediately just keep trying with the access to information we have um our parents can only dream of that and one other thing i want to take it real quick there's a lot of like especially nowadays there's a lot of uh talk about like um who's privileged who's not if you compare yourself going back 100 years or 200 years even the most unprivileged person today is still has access to more information than or not only information even technology than a person from 100 200 years ago 100 years ago just 100 years ago we did not have running water in most of the households even the millionaires and billionaires had their um servants bring the water to them so the fact that technology um gives us so many tools at our disposal don't basically um you're doing your, like no matter where you start off in life uh whether you were born in a poor area whether you're an immigrant whether uh m- maybe you had everything uh from early childhood but like don't don't dwell on being the victim don't try to focus on how life has wronged you focus on what you have access to through technology and how you can leverage that to farther wherever you are in life and don't try to compete with others compete with yourself make sure that each day you're getting slightly better as i've told you earlier like the way this is also like a famous quote and i don't remember from whom but basically most people underestimate most people overestimate what they can achieve in a day and underestimate what they can achieve in a year so as long as you're making progress every day even if that's tiny progress it's a progress it, exactly that's right love that thank you so much thank you so much for being the stars in the making you. uh again i love sharing your story hopefully many people out there they appreciate your story and take a piece of advice that they can take and implement into their own stories so guys uh follow us the stars in the making and subscribe and i will see you guys on the next episode this is the stars in the making Ricardo closing out and Alex. All right. Take care. Thank you.